Hello, I'm Stacy Diefenderfer. I'm a research scientist at VTRC, and I'm going to talk a little bit about balanced mix design case studies and some of the lessons we've learned. First off, to give you an idea of the kind of experience that Virginia has had with balanced mix design, um, I've got some slides showing the projects that we've been doing. Um, our Northern Virginia District and Lynchburg District got their first experiences with balanced mix design in 2019. And in 2020, Richmond District, again Nova, and Fredericksburg District had experiences with a number of mixes and a number of different contractors. In 2020, we also paved our heavy vehicle simulator, which is located in Blacksburg at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. We have put down five balanced mix designs and a typical production control mix in two one and a half inch lifts over compacted aggregate base. And we're going to be loading these to an, determine rutting and fatigue performance. Um, and that's ongoing as of 2021. In 2021, balanced mix design was introduced in some of our plant mix schedules in Salem District, Lynchburg, Richmond, Hampton Roads, and Nova. You'll notice that the mixes that are up here are performance, primarily performance plus volumetric. That means that they were designed to meet both our volumetric specifications and performance criteria. There are mixes in Richmond, in Hampton Roads, and in Northern Virginia that also were designed as P only mix. And so those mixes could be designed to meet only performance criteria. In addition, there were mixes in Northern Virginia using higher wrap contents, 40%. So just to go back to the beginnings of balanced mix design, we are trying to balance our properties and performance. Volumetrics, cracking, rutting, mass loss, and we're also considering moisture susceptibility. The whole goal with balanced mix design is to optimize binder content so that we can get good performance. We can also optimize our performance through aggregate changes, additives, and other things. But this shows a very quick demonstration of how we can use an increase in binder content or a decrease in binder content if needed to bring a mix out of a cracking susceptible area into a better performing area or the green area on the upper left. So for balanced mix design, any factors that contribute to mix variability are magnified in performance testing. Um, anything, we know that variability happens. Um, we are working with non-homogeneous natural materials, but material variation plus mix variability during production, is this going to mean a test failure for you? You must be prepared to pay attention to consistency. Source material consistency, stockpile management, wrap processing and management, proper sampling techniques, and good specimen fabrication practices. Without all of these activities, balanced mix design may not be successful. It is very easy to design a mix, but it is completely a different story once we get into production and volume of mix production to be able to have that consistent material come out that's going to give you a positive test result. To give an idea of how some of the volumetrics interact with balanced mix design properties, we looked at 11 of our benchmark mixes that we used to determine the original Cantabro APA and CT index criteria. You can see in yellow a greater than 75% um, correlation for Cantabro with voids filled with asphalt, VFA. You see a number of correlations that are somewhere between 50 and 75% for CT index with asphalt content, with VFA, effective binder content, and effective film thickness. This shouldn't be surprising. As we know, increase in binder means an increase in cracking um, resistance. For the APA, we can see that there are correlations with VMA, VFA, our FA ratio, and film thickness. These are going to be things that impact your rutting performance. And Cantabro, actually, interestingly enough, for these mixes, which is a very limited data set, had the only very high 
correlation with a negative 0.8 with that VFA and was also impacted by the FA ratio. We need to do more work um, and as industry needs to do work in their own labs with their own mixes, become familiar with mixes, be familiar with your source materials, know what your mixes are doing now so that as we move into balanced mix design, you can take a look at your mixes and make changes that move them in the direction you want them to go. Um, a few more correlations. We looked also at sieve size. Um, and you can see there was very little significant correlations, only for the APA at the 1 half inch and 3 eighths inch path. Sieve. Honestly, I don't think this is, holds out. I think there's going to be more influence from aggregate. But I think we simply, for these mixes, we just don't have a wide enough var variety in the gradations of the mixes to really see that yet. We need to have a much more robust data set. Um, a lot of the research that we've been doing has been gathering mixes, testing mixes, evaluating mixes, so that we can try to populate our database and increase our knowledge of what factors can help you make a mix give the performance that you want it to give. Um, we looked at running predictions, again, with those benchmarking mixes. Um, we took a look with a spreadsheet and developed a regression equation to predict rut depth. Some of the significant factors in that equation were CT index. You can use the CT index to predict rut depth along with other factors. VMA, aggregate specific gravity, and percent passing the number four sieve. I don't think that would be a, a, a reasonable relationship to try to design a mix off of, clearly. But it does give some indications on things that you can change when a mix is not performing as you expect. If your mix is wanting to rut more, you might want to look at your aggregate structure. You might want to look at your aggregate sources. Um, that can be a big help. Um, we need to do more development of these type of relationships and determine which precise volumetric factors can you change to have the desired outcome with the performance testing. So testing BMD mixes. Um, once you've made it through design and you're ready to start testing. Um, some of the important details to consider. Specimen preparation. Um, specimen preparation or fabrication, making that test specimen is one of the biggest sources of variability out there. Um, when we talk about within lab and between lab variability, it is huge. Um, we need to account for test variability. We know that any given test on natural materials will have some inherent variability. We're worried about reheating impacts, even unintentional reheating, where a mix is left in the oven or there was some a specimen didn't come out like it should have, and so mix gets put back in the oven to make another specimen, that will have an impact on your production, your production results for these performance tests. Um, we also know that there are differences between design results and production results. One of the concerns with performance testing is trying to fabricate the samples to the defined air void contents. Um, for Rut testing and for crack testing, we have to have the test specimens compacted to seven plus or minus a half a percent air voids. Um, and remember, these specimens are different sizes from gyro pills. Um, there are several methods to figure out how much mass of material you need to put in that mold um, to get those test specimens. Um, you can use gyro pills um, and work with a spreadsheet that will take your gyro height and voids and calculate it to the height and voids necessary for your performance test and correct for some of those surface air voids to try to get you the most accurate mass so that you can get those voids on your first or second try. Um, you can also do trial specimens. Um, if you know your mix as well, um, I'm hoping everybody's making trial specimens off and on, particularly during design, to get a feel for what they may be, what your initial masses may be during production. That's very useful. Um, but you can do a single point trial. NCAT also has a spreadsheet that's widely available. Um, and you can contact, I think, any of us here with the uh, training to get yourself a copy. Um, one important thing when determining mass and compacting performance specimens, you must use the current sample rice value for accuracy. Do not use the design rice. Do not use a daily rice. You must run a rice on your current sample. 
if the rice value changes, your mass will change and your air voids will change. And you could chase your air voids specimen after specimen after specimen. That is a absolute necessity. Um, some of the other things that we've learned that are very helpful um, to speed up cooling of pills during production. Um, you can use a fan on the counter or an AC unit and place spec hot specimens on a perforated, perforated steel shelf. Um, that will help speed up cooling so that you can get uh, pills bulked faster and get results back faster. Um, there's lots of things that we can try to do and that we're learning about this process. Um, a lot of it boils down to simply going into the lab and working with the materials. A few more ideas on specimen preparation. Um, good sampling practice. A bad sample will equal a poor test specimen. Um, you cannot get good specimens from poor samples. Um, do not let the mix segregate when splitting, weighing out, and loading molds. Um, always use best practices. Um, oven calibration and hot and cold spots in your oven. Um, as you're heating the mixes up and doing aging during design, avoid opening that oven door where possible, understanding that this is production lab, um, there's work going on. Um, but you need to try to be monitoring your specimen temperatures throughout the oven. If you have a hot spot and you compact that specimen and compare it with a specimen that is in a non-hot spot in your oven, you will see variability in results. Performance tests are sensitive to this. This is why they're so good for us to use to try to determine how we can tweak these mixes to get better performance out of them. Um, again, you can use that fan. Uh, you want to be consistent in your fabrication methods and processes. Um, if nothing else, if you're consistent day in, day out with your best practices, your test results will be consistent. Specimen handling is also important with performance specimens. Um, we want to avoid damaging test specimens. Um, keep them at room temperature or below for storage. Setting them on top of a hot oven is not a good place. Uh, your specimen will not give you good results. Um, provide solid support under the specimens. Do not stack them on the, the uh, sides. Lay them on the flat face to avoid deformation. You do not want a flat spot on your rut specimen. And do not stack them. If you stack a number of specimens and it gets a little warm, you're either going to end up with a deformed specimen or a clump of specimens. And neither is going to give you good test results. Um, for transporting, which will become more and more important as we're starting to look at quality control and quality assurance testing, be aware that these specimens can deform and get damaged. Um, always provide solid support when you're moving them or transporting them. Again, lay it on the flat face so that you don't have them rolling around and doing any sort of sagging. Do not stack them. Um, it might be fine to do one or two specimens stacked on top of each other, but you do not want a four foot tall stack of gyro pills or you will not get good Cantabro results. The same goes for the APA and the CT index. Um, do not allow the specimens to get hot. Knowing that we go around and collect specimens at plants and people might be carrying things around all day, watch for those specimens to be sitting inside a closed vehicle or in the bed of a truck in direct sun. It can get hot enough that they will soften, and your test results will show this. I mean, most of this is good practice. We, we, we should be doing all of these things um, for our volumetric pills. Um, but volumetrics is much more forgiving than performance testing. Um, we have a lot more room to wiggle with the volumetric testing. Finally, as you're make, doing designs, Design with a safety factor in mind for your test results. Um, your design result is generally not going to be equivalent to your production result, which will not be equivalent to your reheat result. Um, your design and plant results will generally be better. That means higher CT index, um, lower rut depth, sometimes generally less mass loss. Um, of course, increased asphalt content, your mass loss will go down, rut depths go up, cracking index goes up. Um, some mixes will show an improved CT index with increased mortar or your fines and AC as you're looking at putting together your gradation. Um, this is not every mix, though. Your binder source can impact performance test results. Um, I've been seeing information out 
talking about whether you're using um, binder sources from throughout the country and when controlled tests are done using the same aggregate and different binder sources, performance test results can be significantly different, even when the binders are the same PG grade. Um, so you need to know where you're getting your material from and be able to be assured that you're going to get the same material. Um, as you're doing mix adjustments, these are going to be source and plant specific. Um, the same design, even with the same aggregate source, may not have similar performance through different plants, or you may run a similar mix with different sources through the same plant and have some differences. The, the performance tests are going to be very sensitive to these things. Um, the most important thing is know your source material and know your current mixes so that you have a good ground to stand on as you're trying to design the balanced mix designs. Um, here's an example of some data, um, and this is busy. It is Cantabro mass loss. The blue bars are designs. The green bars are plant produced specimens um, that were compacted at the time of production. Um, the red bars are reheated plant mix. Um, you can see just in general, and this is in general, um, you can see at the bottom all of the mixes they are grouped. Um, some are general standard mixes, 30% wrap, 64S minus 22. Um, and we have two sets of mixes, groups of mixes that have 40% wrap. One with a 64S minus 22 and rec various recycling agents. Um, these are not the same one repeated. Um, and 40% wrap and substituting the binder, dumping to a PG 58 minus 28. Um, what you can see across the board in general is that designs appear to have higher values than our plant material. Um, what that means is that you're going to need to design to have a maximum of 7.5% and you can expect that your mass loss should drop as material comes through the plant. I think that makes sense. The plant probably has, a, I would say I'm certain the plant has better mixing, um, you're having more dwell time, you're having silo time. Um, these mixes have a little more time to come together um, and it's going to increase your durability. Um, however, if you reheat that mix, reheating tends to drive up the mass loss. That's not particularly surprising either because as we reheat the mix, we age it. And an aged mix becomes stiffer, more brittle, and your mass loss will increase. Um, and we see this across all sorts of different types of mixes. Um, we see a few little outliers there. Uh, mix F on the far right, um, you can see that the plant material had the highest mass loss for some reason. Um, interesting observation. But again, these are a number of mixes from across the state, different plants, um, different well, obviously different aggregate sources, different binder sources, different recycling agents, and so on. Um, so you can see the kind of variability that we're looking at. When, as you're designing, you need to make sure that you're taking that into account. You don't want to design very close to a failure criteria and then have your material go through the plant and start failing, even though it passed on design. Um, rut depth is another one of these. Um, the same uh, bars, blue are design, green are plant, the red stripes are reheated. Um, as you can see, we don't seem to have a rutting issue. Um, I think that's been pretty self-evident probably the last decade or more. Um, all of our mixes seem to do very well in rutting with more or less wrap. Um, but you see that you can have different outcomes. Um, for a while we were seeing mixes and it looked very much like the designs were going to come out to be equivalent to reheats. Um, the more mixes we get, the more that that may or may not hold true. Um, we really need to continue getting a robust set of mixes. Finally, the CT index. Um, this may be the hardest criteria of the three to design for simply because so many factors can impact your cracking resistance. Um, you can increase binder, that's kind of an easy one, but you can start playing with your aggregate structure and look at that impact. Um, for these, we have the blue design, the orange bars, which are generally, in all cases, I think, but one, the shortest bars um, in mixes. Those were long-term oven-aged specimens. 
The mix was uh, long-term oven aged for eight hours before being compacted and then tested. Um, you can see what that does to your cracking. Um, in particular, as we start moving into looking at recycling agents um, and the impact of various additives, um, that aging should be able to give us an indication of whether the additive state remains active in the mix over time or if it is more of a transient phenomenon. Um, you notice that the plant mix samples, the green, are generally higher um, and reheats drop. In some cases, the reheats are similar to the designs. In some cases, they are lower. Um, we're going to need to figure out the shifting between reheat and plant-made specimens. Uh, we've been working diligently on this and working very hand in hand with a lot of folks who have been making us specimens that we're very appreciative of, thank you all, um, and testing these and trying to get enough information to determine you know, what is it about a mix that makes it change during that reheat period and how can we relate that so that during quality control, we would have plant-made specimens and eventually VDOT can go to a reheat specimen. We do not want industry to be making QC specimens or IA specimens for the DOT forever. Um, the idea is to get away from this as soon as possible so that we improve workload. And I think that wraps us up. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any information that you think would be great for others to know in this presentation, please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to add more experience and more information um, so that we can all make this a successful effort.